So hi everyone to um, who's in Valley City uh, in Portugal and everyone who's uh, participating around the world. As you can probably see, I'm not unfortunately in Portugal. I'm stuck here um, in Leeds, but I'm very happy that I'm able to participate remotely in this great conference and from what I've seen on social media it has already been a huge success. Um, cycling is a global community. The problems that we solve are international in nature, so we absolutely need international solutions to these problems. And it's so good to see all of the activity going on in so many different places. There's a huge amount that we can learn from each other. So yeah, my name's Robin. I'm a researcher based at the University of Leeds and my presentation is about how technologies and specifically open source and participatory technologies can be part of the solution to the transport problems uh, that we know cycling can help solve. And I'm going to talk about why technology is so important and then I'm going to move very quickly for the majority of the talk. I'll be talking about the solutions and how technology can help and technology that is available right now um, to uh, help out uh, solve some of these problems. So just making myself a bit smaller so you can actually see the slides. Um, here they are. And yeah, this is um, the, the talk and it's by myself. Rosa Felix, who I believe is in there in person, and Lake Sagaris, who's based in Chile. So this reflects the international nature of what we're talking about and um, also brings uh, out the diversity um, in, that is needed to create successful technological projects. So it's not just uh, techies. Okay, so um, there's a very long abstract here, which I'm definitely not going to read out. There's a hundred word summary, which is also quite long, but basically it's talking about how free and participatory tools can overcome some of the bottlenecks in the planning process and how they can actually help make the planning system more democratically accountable. So it's much bigger than simply providing evidence as a kind of technocratic process. This is about um, engaging the community and creating a more participatory culture, which is conducive um, to better transport planning. And I've got a quote there uh, from uh, ages back from Francis Bacon that says, knowledge is power. Um, and I think um, in that context, what we're trying to do is go from um, data which is very low quality, but it's still information about potentially thousands of people. And then you can convert that into information. And if you condense that and communicate it in an open way, that can be a very powerful thing. And in terms of the problem, I, I said I, would gonna, I was gonna talk about the problem. I've got um, three illustrations of the problem. One from my home city of Leeds, which was described as the motorway city of the 1970s. So you can imagine what the problem is like there. Huge amounts of space dedicated um, to private motor vehicles. And what's interesting is when you look at other cities, um, so I've got, um, this is from Cape Town in South Africa. And this is actually from Lisbon. It's a photo I found of Lisbon, Portugal the same problems manifest themselves. So it's not like we've got a single uh, problem in one city, everywhere is seeing the same thing. And what I think also is that if we go one step further, we can look at the causes, the underlying causes of these symptoms. So um, it, are those problems or are they symptoms of a deeper problem? And my hypothesis is that actually there's a deeper problem, which is the planning process that has led to this type of development. And a very simplistic sketch of it is 
um, depicted in this cartoon above, which shows um, a black box system crunching all of this information about factories, this idea of economic growth, and then um, returning a certain type of uh, transport plan. And that, I think, is the planning process, or at least it has been for the majority of the last um, 70 years or so, um, since the beginnings of transport models in the 1950s. So that's a separate conversation, but um, the, the point is that the priorities of transport planners have changed. They were focused on enabling economic growth and enabling more uh, explosive growth in car ownership. And they genuinely thought that they were do doing a good thing. The problem is that the architecture of um, the models and the whole planning process was therefore adapted towards the car. And my point is that when the priorities change, the tools and the models also need to change. But these things have a lot of inertia, so they take time to change. But with the evidence of the climate crisis, there's increasing consensus, basically, even from planners working in the system, that change is needed. So I think um, essentially transport models represent a leverage point within the whole planning system that can lead to step changes. So we need to really think about the fundamentals of the models uh, that we're using. And I could talk at length about the problems with established um, tools. However, what I'm going to do more optimistically is go straight on to talk about the solution. So the solution to me is fairly clear in the same way that the solution to um, the transport problems are, um, is clear. It's reduce car use, increase car free zones, enable more um, walking and cycling in livable neighbourhoods. In terms of the modelling, it's fairly clear as well. We need participatory tools that enable us to envision the future that we want to build. It, there's a lot of evidence that if you think about the future that you want to create and you actually draw it or depict it in some way, it's more likely to become reality. So we actually need to create those futures. And it's much, it, it's very powerful and much more likely to happen if those visions of change are actually based on the evidence. And that's what open source planning tools can do. And if many people see them and can participate in them. So I've got here a list of tools. Um, there's loads of Python packages, R packages, and various other things. So there is actually a, quite a healthy open source ecosystem out there. And again, I'm not gonna talk about um, specific pro um, projects or products. Um, and I did a, a review of these tools and basically found that there's a ecosystem, but one of the problems is actually not technological, it's in terms of the inertia to change from the institutions and the organizations involved. So these open tools need someone to um, encourage their use. And that may, may well be government. The people providing the funding need to incentivize these tools if they're going to be used. So the technology is there and ready, but it's just a kind of cultural change. And there are barriers to entry in terms of um, the skills required to use some of these tools. So the next step towards, um, it's, uh, towards the wide uptake of these open participatory tools is making them not just open source, but open access. And by open access, I mean, tools that don't require specialist training to use. So anyone should be able to look at them and start interacting them, kind of like a, with a computer game, thinking back to stuff like SimCity. So moving very quickly through uh, some of these tools, you've got the propensity to cycle tool, uh, which um, I'm the lead developer of this tool, which ha is now the number one uh, strategic cycle planning tool being used by cities across England and Wales um, and it basically just creates quite simple scenarios of change but on a massive city scale 
So it enables you to visualize how um, cycling levels could change over time. So I've got here a map that shows uh, cycling potential under the Go Dutch scenario and this is cycling to school potential, which is actually really important and often ignored um, in, the, in the planning process, which tends to focus on uh, commute data. Um, I'm not gonna go through the key aspects of the propensity to cycle tool, but one of the key things is that it can be replicated in other countries. So the technology is open, it's free to use, so it encourages wider society to engage in the transport planning process. But, um, but moving towards the conclusions, there's a number of things that we need to do going beyond the approach that we took in the Propensity to Cycle tool, which is a multi-university project involving um, people from sociology backgrounds, people interested in the policy, the health modeling, so we also need a diversity of people involved in these projects. And the first way we need to go beyond the approach is go beyond just the commute and even beyond travel to school. We need to include more types of trip to um, generate more dense residential networks. I think that's there's a big lack of evidence in that space. Uh, the good news is the technology is there to do that. We need to go beyond cycling, I think. In terms of modelling, uh, cycling is just one part and sometimes a small part of a much bigger system. Um, and that is now possible. So this is prototype multimodal um, cycling and walking uptake model. Um, but there's more work needed. We also need to be able to represent scenarios of change. And this is also possible in the AB Street um, open source city simulation tool. Um, and we also, I think, need to stop just thinking about mode shift, but also think about destination shifting. So thinking of the typical travel to work scenario, rather than uh, traveling 20 miles to work, why not work from home and then you can cycle to uh, a workplace or maybe even just to the cafe um, and, and, have, and, and basically change the geographic lay layout of society so it's much more based around local communities. So that's um, a few ways that we need to go beyond the um, current paradigm in transport planning. We need to go beyond the um, commute-based origin destination data represented in early versions of the propensity to cycle tool. And the, the, there's many ways to do this. So it's not gonna happen by itself. We need people with influence and budgets and political power to get behind open source approaches to prevent them being monopolized by um, essentially m companies that are not necessarily working um, in the public interest. So there's a whole load of things that people at every level can do, but I do think the political support is really important and that's the main one that I wanted to emphasize um, in this talk. So final thing to say is we do hope to take this forward. So watch this space around active travel uptake modeling. Um, and I'm working on projects with Lake and Rosa and others, including the Propensity to Cycle Tool team in England and Wales to try and get these kind of methods out there and more widely available internationally. So I will make the slides available on my website. Thanks a lot for listening. Obviously I won't be able to take questions but um, I look forward to taking them via the online platform at Velo City and I wish you a great conference everyone who's listened and thank you very much.